Stoll, who joined in the lively chat session over episode 134. And thanks to Joseph, who asked if we could look at LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravity Wave Observatory. LIGO deals with something predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was dreamed up in Minkowski's mathematical space-time. As Soddy pointed out in episode 43, that was just a mythomagical trick, making time and space completely equivalent. As we saw in the last episode, even mathematicians are now recognising that as totally invalid. Science needs to get back to the obvious reality of space and time being completely different. LIGO was built to confirm Einstein's prediction of gravity waves. Well, that could be considered pretty reasonable. Einstein grudgingly admitted he had been wrong about the non-existence of the ether, but he'd tried to cover up the embarrassment of his special theory's denial of the ether. That denial was absolutely essential for being able to deny Michelson and Morley's demonstration that the Earth does not orbit the Sun. And even though he admitted that the most sensitive experiments, and not just Michelson and Morley's, had not detected a trace of movement of the Earth, he, like everybody else, was somehow convinced the Earth must orbit the Sun. So he made up some rules for his version of the ether. It could influence mass and gravity, but it could have no influence on light. But later, when Minkowski's mathematical space-time had been given the status of an all-pervading medium exactly equivalent to the ether, it was admitted it could be associated with electromagnetism and light after all. Only the name needed to be changed. And we shouldn't forget, Maxwell's very successful equations depended on the ether's interaction with electromagnetism. They correctly predict the speed of light as a function of the electrical permittivity and the magnetic permeability of the all-pervading fabric of space which for centuries had been called the ether. And based on the ether, his equations explain almost every phenomenon in electromagnetism. Einstein's initial arbitrary limitation of the ether had been pure wishful thinking for the benefit of saving physics from acknowledging the Michelson and Morley result. Even admitting the ether at all is such an embarrassment that it had to be renamed the fabric of space-time. So gravitational waves must be carried by the fabric of space-time, which we are told, when things become too embarrassing, is not a real medium it's only a theoretical field. We met this in episode 79, when a Cal physics expert told us, The waves are not waves of anything substantive, but are ripples in a state of a theoretically defined field. However, these waves do carry energy and momentum, and each wave has a specific direction, frequency, and polarization state. We can see what a sorry state the physicists of the world are in. They have to acknowledge the ether, but are so ashamed of the consequences, they have to duck and dive and pretend that a purely theoretical field can carry real energy, real momentum, 
and have real specific states like direction, frequency and polarization. But it still has no physical reality. It's just a purely theoretical field. So, how do they propose to identify the gravitational waves which Einstein predicted? You may find it hard to believe this. They're using a modified version of Michelson and Morley's interferometer, which only works with real waves in the real ether. This interferometer has two arms at right angles to each other, but instead of Michelson Morley's arm length of four feet, LIGO's arm length is four miles. The gravitational waves they're searching for have a very weak signal, with a far lower frequency and a far longer wavelength than light, so the apparatus has to be very much larger than Michelson and Morley's. The size of the effect they're looking for is smaller than the size of an atom divided by the distance to the moon. It's smaller than the movement caused at the detector by a lorry moving along a road four miles away. Smaller than the movement caused by a tree being felled in a forest quite a bit further away than that. And vastly smaller than very small earth tremors. And that reminds me of Brian G. Wallace's The Farce of Physics, which we looked at in episode 101. His chapter 2 is entitled Pathological Physics. It follows the work of the famous physicist Irving Langmuir, described in the October 1989 issue of Physics Today. Langmuir starts off by explaining that pathological or sick physics results when well-meaning physicists allow themselves to be led astray by subjective effects, wishful thinking or threshold interactions. This pathological physics tends to happen when the maximum effect that is observable is produced by a causative agent of barely detectable intensity. Does that raise a possible warning about LIGO? They're looking for an effect millions of times smaller than an atom. The next problem Langmuir points to as identifying sick science is... These observations are near the threshold of visibility of the eyes. Any other sense, I suppose, would work as well. Or, many measurements are necessary. Many measurements because of the low statistical significance of the results. Well, the signal to be measured is so many millions of times smaller than an atom that lots of tricks have to be employed to magnify it, and vast numbers of things like lorries on a road a few miles away have to somehow be filtered out. And they try a stack of checks and balances and take very large numbers of measurements. But it's worth noting Langmuir's next point. Now the trouble with that is this. Most people have a habit, when taking measurements of low significance, of finding a means of rejecting data. They're right at the threshold value, and there are many reasons why they can discard data. And they only report data, which seems to fit the theory. The last comment of this part of Wallace's book is... In an evaluation of modern physics based on Langmuir's arguments, we find that many of the dominant theories should be classed as pathological science. 
For example, starting with his first characteristic rule. The maximum effect that is observed is produced by a causative agent of barely detectable intensity. We find that Einstein's special relativity theory, which is generally acknowledged to be the foundation of the rest of the dominant theories of 20th century physics, is based on the fact that the Michelson Morley experiment could not detect the motion of the Earth through the ether. As I have shown in Chapter 3, Mathematical Magic, Einstein believed that the ether sea exists, but that it is invisible and can't be detected by experiments. The LIGO experiments only make any sense at all in the context of waves travelling through a medium embarrassingly known for a couple of hundred years as the ether, which physicists are now determined to rename the fabric of space-time. And LIGO's claim to fame is apparently detecting collisions of black holes, which, as we saw in episode 89, are impossible. The only claimed picture of a black hole is a total forgery. The LIGO people admit they have never seen a black hole, and neither has anybody else. We just have some Photoshop speculations of what they might be like. But they claim that their observations prove the existence of black holes. Well, just suppose that's true. So what? Would that make the slightest scrap of difference to your life or mine? Many hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money have gone into the search for those elusive gravitational waves, and a whole lot more on searching for those mythical black holes. Of course, the scientists involved make a big song and dance about how important this is, and why they should be given a whole lot more taxpayers' money for more research. But I think our heroine Sabina has a far more reasonable attitude to stuff like this. In 2017, she published a paper in Nature pointing out the worthlessness of much of modern physics research. A very senior physicist wrote her a letter. He asked her to keep it confidential. She read it many times over the last few years and eventually decided she really ought to share it. See what you think. Actually, I'd like to ask you next time, think not only about short-term personal benefits, but about the community in general. Do you understand what consequences your publication might bring for our community? What are all these BSM model builders with exaggerated self-opinion going to do afterwards? What about experimentalists who survive hiding inside big multi-TV collaborations? Can you offer them all any decent employment alternatives? Some of them have families and young children. Some of them are already too old to get employment elsewhere. For some of them, academia is the only way to get U.S. visa. If you like, yes, what we created is a bubble, but it helps thousands of those guys and their families not to die from hunger. We all do the same stuff and have some trade secrets. For example, I'm one of the authors of the so-called model. Pretty useless stuff, old refurbished with a couple of new blows and whistles. But if people buy this and it helps them to get grants, who cares? For people who pay us, all we do is just noise. They have zero idea that elementary particles exist. They pay us from public funds, not from their own, and basically pay for something cool, some new crazy hype, which they need either to include into their science spending reports or, in case of universities, to attract students. Your paper made a lot of noise and most likely will affect redistribution of HEP funds towards other 
areas, but I doubt that you'll be able to suggest and implement any organizational changes. Also, any changes of quality criteria which would demonstrate uselessness of somebody's work will have zero chance of approval. I understand that all what I wrote above might sound a bit harsh, sorry for this, but this is how our society is built, and this is not only a problem in the HEP community, but also exists in all other areas. My heart is bleeding when I regularly see bright and intelligent persons with independent ways of thinking, leaving academia or getting kicked out, whereas obedient idiots remain. But there's nothing we can do. Those who get kicked out usually find better opportunities outside of academia. Those who remain in academia accept the rules and and enjoy the comfort of academic life. I'm reading this to you as an illustration, a rare example of somebody else's honest words. In contrast to the person who sent this email, I don't think that taxpayers are stupid. We're not paying physicists for crazy new hype. We want to see results. And soon taxpayers will start asking some tough questions. Should this situation be well known among the scientists, but never disclosed to the taxpayers who pay them vast amounts of money? For many deceivers are entered into the world. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.